So I'm just going to move into kind of the lab and what uh, what we'll be doing. So a little bit more information on pulse echo testing. So when we do our lab, uh, we're going to have a test piece, and we're going to do a we're going to have a transducer that we put along one surface of it, one one thing. And initially, you're going to set up over an area without a defect, and so that's where we're going to have to calibrate. And there's a couple ways we can do this. You're going to have to calibrate the probe in an area that's a known good area. And again, for this, you're primarily going to be in the lab working with calibration. You're learning how to calibrate the equipment, learning how to find known flaws in a calibration sample. And so when we put our part on there, you can see I've turned the part sideways to kind of demonstrate that relationship between the initial pulse where the sound first enters and then the back wall. And on your tester, there's several things that you can adjust in order to do that. The first thing is, depending on the size of the part, you can change how long, how far of a distance you're looking at. This is your time slash distance. And we can, we can adjust it for time or distance. Most of the time, we're most interested in distance in our case. So in this, here we have an example of a part that's eight inches long. And to make things easy, the screens typically have a grid on them of some kind. And it's often easiest if you can align your units with the grid on the screen. So here, for example, the grid is aligned with the one inch marks on the screen. And so you can change your screen length. And there's two ways that that'll be described. One is you can do the overall length. You can say, my screen is going to show 10 inches, okay? And it has 10 divisions, right? Or another way you can say that is, I'm going to display it as one inch per division. It's showing the same thing. You just have to know what it is. And, and the reason that's important is whether you're working in overall range or working in inches or, or units per division, that can be changed. You can, most of the testers, you have that option. You can set it one way or the other. And if you have it set for inches per division and you're thinking in total range, right, you're going to have trouble getting it to show what you want to see. Or vice versa. If you're looking at total range and you're doing inches per division, you'll say that you're, you're working in total range, but you're saying, I'm going to set it for one inch per division. You set it to one, and it's actually set for total range. That would mean all you'd be looking at was this first little one area right here. So you got to pay attention to what your tester's set at. And so there's that initial pulse at zero. And that is set. We set our initial pulse by adjusting what's called the zero offset. We can take this whole indication, okay, the peaks, the, essentially the, the return signal. We can take this whole indication. We can move everything left and right by changing something called the zero offset. Okay, so we have to, that's one of the calibration steps we have to do is get our zero offset set correctly. And that is because that acoustic interface between the probe and the part are going to depend on the specific probe and the material of the wear plate it's made out of and the material you're putting the part on and what kind of uh, initial pulse it's going to produce where that sound enters the part. And then we need to know how thick our test block is, and then we can adjust our sound, our velocity of sound, to get our back wall echo to line up with that distance. Okay. There's that back wall echo. So what would happen if we set our sound velocity too high? If we tell the machine the sound of the speed of sound in that material is higher than what it actually is, what would it do to the position of this back wall echo? It would what? You're pointing to the so it would it would make it seem too smaller than it is, right? Because remember, this is the, the the tester is measuring how long does it take 
for the sound to get from here back to here, right? And if we say the sound, no, so, So our sound is going to come from the, the face of the probe to the back wall and back again. And it's going to count. Let's work in seconds and it's easier. And when you get into the lab, you're going to be working in milliseconds. It's, it's, it's inches per millisecond. But here we'll talk about saying, say it goes one, two, three, four. Say it takes four seconds to get there. What if I tell the part or the, the tester that our sound is traveling faster than it actually is. I'm going to write the math up on the board just so people can see. So we said it took four, right? So let's do the ideal case first. Let's say we want to get eight inches. And I said it took four seconds to get eight inches, right? What do I have to multiply that? What is my theoretical speed of sound right now? Two inches per second, right? Do this to the, okay. Two times four seconds cancel out, leaves us with inches on the other side, right? So what happens if I were to make that high? Let's say it still takes four seconds to get back and forth. But now we've told the tester we'll just do three inches per second. I'll just do round numbers. Let's say we've accidentally told the tester it's three inches per second. What's it gonna tell us? It's gonna tell us that our part's actually is twelve inches. The tester's gonna say. So if your speed of sound is too high it's going to make it appear larger than it is, okay? Consequently, if your speed of sound is too low, it's going to make it appear shorter than it is. The, the tester is doing this. It's saying, okay, how long is that sound pulse taking? It's going to multiply it by whatever speed of sound you program in to give you your distance. What's the term for data entry when, when you're referring to data? Anyone ever heard that and do that? Crap in, crap out? Ever heard that before when you're dealing with a computer? It's only as good as what you put into it. It's only as good as the person operating it. You put crap in, you put the wrong speed of sound in, you're going to get the wrong distance out the other end. Okay? So we have to calibrate that. Now, you'll be given... Earlier in the lectures, we looked at speed of sound in various materials, right? The speed of sound in a material is fixed. We can't change that without changing some of the environmental conditions. What can vary the speed of sound in a material? What's the biggest thing that will change the speed of sound in a given material? What changes density? The temperature. The temperature of the material can change the density, which will change the speed of sound. Okay. Now, we typically aren't going to sit there. We don't really have a way to warm a part up or cool a part down, you know, to try to get it. So what we can do is tweak the speed of sound in our tester to match what that speed of sound is currently. So those speed of sound tables, they're a starting point. They'll say, okay, for this material, it's 0.3572 inches per microsecond. That's your starting point. Then we need to calibrate, you know, maybe today in this given material, instead of 0 0.3572 inches per microsecond, it's actually 0 0.3570 inches per microsecond. Or maybe it's 0.3578 inches per microsecond, depending on the time. So that's where we have to make that, that's what we're going to be adjusting over here to get an accurate distance. So we got to know the, the, thick, the distance, we have to have a known distance to compare our our output against and adjust the speed of sound to match what it is exactly at that moment in time. And so if, 
if we did our test, if we were setting up on our standard here, and it showed our speed, or it showed the back wall was too far away from the front wall, how would we fix that? What would we change about the speed of sound that we have in our tester? What would we have to do? Our distance is too big. We want to get from here to here. What do we have to do to the speed of sound? Here's our speed of sound. Speed of sound, okay? So we would have to decrease. That tells us the speed of sound we have programmed in there is too big. What if instead of being at eight inches here, it showed our back wall was at seven inches? What would we have to do? We would have to increase our speed of sound that we program into the tester. Okay, to adjust for those environmental differences for that change in temperature on a given day. So once we've done that, that's our division. I showed, I talked about that just for division. Other things are things like frequency and gain that we can adjust. Okay. Frequency, you're probably not going to adjust very much. Okay, it can have some effect. But the biggest thing is we have to match our frequency to the probe we're using. So you're going to look at your probe, and it's going to say on there if it's a 5 megahertz probe or a 10 megahertz probe. That's what you're going to set your tester to. You just got to make sure you set the frequency to match what the probe's designed to work with. Okay. That one's pretty easy. Gain is how sensitive that essentially a microphone is to pick up that return signal. So what is gain going to affect on here, do you think? It's going to affect the height, right? This is the intensity or the amplitude of the sound coming back. So if we make the, 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 the receiver portion of the transducer, if we make it more sensitive, if we amplify that return signal more by turning up the gain, the gain is how much we're amplifying the return signal. That's going to cause those peaks to get taller. Okay. If we turn it down, the peaks will get shorter. So looking at this diagram, what do you think you want, you want to happen? What would happen if we turn that gain up too high? Our initial pulse and or typically our back wall may go off the top of the screen, right? Now, this pulse, you can see, has some width to it. These are doing what they call the, the front slope is where they're setting it. They set their, their zero and their eight inches at the front slope. You can also do it to the back slope. So if you put this, if you put this initial pulse at zero here, you would go to the back slope. Or you can do peak to peak. And there's different ways to set up your, trans, your, uh, your test equipment. But if it's going off the top of the screen, it makes it hard to get. The other thing is as you increase the gain, you'll start to get a bunch more. You can see there's a little bit of, you know, this isn't a totally straight line, especially over here in the one, two, three area. Right? That's some interference. The higher you turn the gain, the more interference you're going to get. That can hide flaws as well. So you don't want the gain too high because your indications may go off the top of the screen. Your interference will get too high. What if your gain is too low? What do you think will happen? You'd miss small indications, right? They wouldn't even create a peak that would be visible for you to see on the screen. So again, that gain is something you're going to play with to kind of do that. So once we've calibrated those things, once we've set our initial pulse or our, our zero position, once we've gotten our back wall all figured out, once we've set our frequency, we've probably set before we've done any of that, and then kind of dialed in our gain, then we can start to do our testing. And so we will put our, we will move our probe into areas over a known defect and we'll verify, you know, that it comes up. Or, you know, in this case, they're showing an investigation. So here you can see a couple things. I don't really have these side by side. But let me compare this to this. You can see here in the unflawed area, we get a, a back wall peak that has an amplitude about eight on this scale. And that's an arbitrary scale. It doesn't mean anything 
other than it's just they've divided the screen into 10 units top to bottom. So you can see here the, the back wall echo is almost eight. When we get a defect, you can see you're still getting a back wall echo in the same spot, but it's gone lower because you know they show one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven sound lines, right? Well, here, all seven of them are creating that back wall echo. Here, four of them are still creating the back wall echo now, and three of them are bouncing off of this crack that's at about five inches. This defect. And not only that, the, the back wall has reduced, you know, that, that peak amplitude is reduced because we don't have as big of an area that's bouncing the sound back at, at eight inches now. The other thing you can see is even though they only show three of the, the sound waves bouncing here to the, to the crack, that one's higher because now that sound isn't traveling as far. But the big key is you can see how far that crack is from the front face away from the front face and the part. With an actual tester, it looks something like this. So here is a back wall echo. See, it's not quite as clear as our single pulse. And there's what it looks like when we go over a flaw. This red bar, whenever a pulse breaks it, it's going to give you a, uh, can be used to create a measurement. And we can set those bars. This black bar over here is your back wall bar. It shows the distance. So you can see here it's showing the total thickness of the part is 0.5. And when you get a flaw, it's showing that flaw is at 0.25. It's half the distance is shown over here. So we can use these to measure as well. So we'll do a demo of this in lab, setting it up and how to calibrate it and all that. <clears throat> 